Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is the other thing I do. My guest this week is Mark Gagliardi, an actor whose work I've loved for years as Croach the Tracker and the faithful Martian companion of Sparks, Nevada, Marshall on Mars, on the late lamented Thrilling Adventure Hour. He's also appeared on Drunk History, voiced Batman on DC Super Friends, and done a whole bunch of other cool stuff, including the Maximum Fun podcast, We Got This, with Mark and Hal. It was a pleasure to grab him on my New York trip earlier this month, and Mark picked Center Stage, which I would have thought was a mostly forgotten 2000 programmer in the fame mode, except that, of course, it's a favorite of anyone who grew up wanting to be a performer in the fame mode. It was directed by Nicholas Heitner during his American cinema period, and it's a story of a group of teenagers coming to the American Ballet Academy in New York to be their very best selves. It's an unapologetic melodrama, and that's kind of its strength. Anyway, you'll, you'll hear about it in the conversation, which ranges all over the place, as you'll see when Mark and I start talking. This is someone else's movie. Center Stage, for me, was it was one of those movies that came out right at the exact right moment in my life. Because I was, I had, I had graduated, this came out in 2000, I graduated high school in 97. So okay. it was a couple years after. But when I graduated high school, I all I wanted in my life was to go to Juilliard. Right. Uh, and I came and visited Juilliard when I was a senior in high school, and I loved the, the, Lincoln Center is just such a, a vibrant space. And uh, met the woman, um, Kimberly Hoof, I think was her name. Mm-hmm. Very nice lady, the admissions director. And she took me all around the school and we chatted for a couple hours. She really like delved in and was great. And, uh, and over Christmas, I was filling out all of my school applications. And uh, I'm looking at them and it's like, all right, all of them. It's like, did us fill this out, send it in by January 1st, sign here. Okay, get to Juilliard, fill this out, send it in by December 24th. I was doing this on Christmas Day oh. afternoon. So like a real bozo, the one school that I'd wanted to go to was the only one whose admissions were due a week earlier oh. than the rest. Or the postmark was due a week earlier than right. the rest of them, and I'd never noticed. So I... I had been obsessed with this school forever and now, you know, dream dashed. I went to a great school. I loved it. I met all of my lifetime friends there. I got involved with Second City through that and um, loved it and met Aaron. Uh, oh. We were roommates. Uh, Aaron Abrams and I were roommates at, uh, at DePaul. So it was a great school. That aside, I always had this obsession with um, with that sort of like vibe. The, I, I loved school. I loved the camaraderie of school. I loved the sense of ensemble. I loved the uh, cracking an idea that you had not figured out and suddenly getting it. Yeah, so, yeah. Same reason I like a Rocky montage. Like <laughs> I will work out to, I found on YouTube, all of the Rocky oh, montages Jesus, tied together. together. Oh yeah. So I will get on the elliptical and I will watch all of the Rocky montages in a row. Wait, aren't you frustrated that he doesn't get any better? That he has to keep doing it movie after? Yeah, that, he, <laughs> that he's constantly why it's like, oh, this time you need the kids to run up the yeah. stairs with you. Why aren't you there yet, Rock? Yeah. Why aren't you there? <laughs> but yeah, no, the thing that you're describing is absolutely the thing that I, I'm fascinated by these, these, they're like. It's like it's how I imagine the X Men hang out. Like theater kids, yeah. they're not like me. They might, you're you're of that world. <laughs> I was of the theater kid world. Yeah. yeah, I was a film student kid and a journalist student, like mm-hmm. a J school kid, and we just sit around and talk about stuff other people have done. Right. But you guys can go and do your thing for each other. It's like it's every one of these movies. Center stage has it. Fame has it. We're mm-hmm. just where people are like, hey, look, I got this thing with the guitar, and I got this thing with my front toe that I can stand on, and it's right. just like watching mutants. So, well, hey, let me freak, let me uh, shake up your drink for you with my uh, rocket power. That yeah, everybody has a special thing yeah. that they do. Uh, and also, everybody is really flawed and misfits, but sure. forced to work together. Yeah. Um, Again, X-Men. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Self-hating, um, psychologically damaged, physically oh. perfect specimens. And this movie has all of them. It too. Really it's got, does. It's, this movie is... Arguably wonderful and arguably terrible. Yeah. I remember um, thinking, like, everything happens on cue. Yeah, but it really does. But it's satisfying. Like, it, mm-hmm. it, for people who have seen it, 
recently, I imagine it's a different experience because mm -hmm. there's no social media. There's like everyone is alone in center stage. They're all alone with themselves. And yeah. that doesn't happen anymore. Like now you can find people on YouTube that you want to be like or be with and you can meet people in the world that you might not otherwise have encountered. But in 2000, it's like an X-Men movie because mm -hmm. I thought I was the only one and all, everybody comes together and yeah. then we get to watch them go through their individual psychological and, and biological torments. It is jarring to think of it as a period piece. <laughs> it is now. Though. It is. Yeah, be, like, well, yeah, I mean, look at fame. Look at the, the first The original fame, fame is yeah. Yeah, totally a period I was, 12 when that came out or mm -hmm. 13 and that was that was as inspirational for the people around me the friends of mine who wanted to be theater kids and mm -hmm. wanted to you know like just just express themselves yeah and everybody started dressing like Irene Cara which was weird of course like, everybody guys, had the but, thing off the shoulder yeah well, and that, that <laughs> led to flash dance and footloose like it was yeah. it was a musical in a way that musicals weren't mm -hmm. and center stage doesn't even do that like it just boils it down even further to archetypes it's just archetypes and also uh, old timey, uh, <laughs> old timey stereotypes. Yes, interpretations of, of talent. Yes, there's the. Uh, I mean, there's the the sassy black girl with the Latin last name Zoe Saldana, who's right. great in this movie. Zoe Saldana has a moment in this movie that may be my favorite Zoe Saldana moment, and I've liked her in lots and lots of yeah. things. But when she storms out of uh, a ballet class, goes outside to have a cigarette. And then puts it out by crushing it with her point shoe. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the for the uh, for the theater kid in me <laughs> who grew up, and I was also I was also always had a crush on the dancers. So, right. you know, that's of course it's like oh, this is perfect. Yeah, and it was shot right where Juilliard is at the American Ballet. Uh, American Ballet Theater, they changed it to American Ballet Company for right. this. That but slight it's disconnection. The slight, yeah. Please don't sue, please don't sue. Exactly. But back to the archetypes, mm -hmm. I mean, it really is like the main cast of characters, for your listening audience who doesn't know yeah. the film. In case you haven't caught up with it in a while. Right, uh, which I just recently caught up with it uh, over the course of doing this. So for those of your audience who don't quite know the, uh, the story, the movie, first of all, Go see it. You may want to make a drinking game out of it. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, okay, here's a drinking game you can make out of the archetypes. Uh, every time Jodie Sawyer, the main character, is told she's not good enough to be at American Ballet Theater, you have to drink. Every time Maureen, the star pupil, goes into a bathroom to throw up, right. you have to drink. Like I said, on cue. On cue. On cue yeah. every time. And the boyfriend happens to walk by the bathroom. The first moment where she does this <laughs> is brilliant because you don't know that she's bulimic until she looks down at a piece of pizza and the camera does a slow zoom in on the piece of pizza. Yeah. And you're like, oh, all right, I get what's going to happen. Yeah. Next scene, she goes into the bathroom and you just hear in the stall. Hoo! It's weird that this was made by a director who started on stage. I find that Nicholas Heitner's career is... A really odd one because was he a theater director? He was a theater director. He made the movie of the Madness of King George, mm -hmm. which I think he directed on stage as the Madness of George the mm Third. -hmm. And he mostly works on stage now. He directs like one every, makes a movie like once every eight or eight or nine years, as mm -hmm. far as I can tell. Center stage, and then the History Boys, and then I don't think anything until History Boys, which was also a play, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. yeah, and then Lady in the Van, which was also also a play. Mm -hmm. uh, that was last year. He's. He was in this weird little American period where he came immediately over with, uh, I guess it was a sort of a, a hybrid. He made The Crucible with mm -hmm. Winona Ryder and Daniel Day-Lewis, and I want to say Joan Allen. I'm pretty sure that's a play, too. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. And that's what he was clearly trusted with. And yeah. then his next film was The Object of My Affection. I don't know that. Uh, Paul Rudd and Jennifer Aniston, and he's gay, and she wants him. That's basically okay. the logline. It's, it's right. not good. Um, the source material is apparently better. But it not only has it dated absolutely horribly, but its sexual politics were bad from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And Aniston was in that weird flailing period where people were just, well, it's not her fault. She got offered a lot of stuff, and I think she took it all in that window. And mm -hmm. so she just turned up in a lot of movies that weren't fully thought through. Sure. They had to rush to get the schedule finished to make the next one or to get her back to friends. And then Rudd was just, poor guy. He's just, there are a couple of scenes where it's just really clear that he doesn't want to be there. But yeah. He, he either can't figure the character out or no one will let him. Uh, and so it's just this thing that sits there. I remember seeing it with an audience that was so prepped. This mm -hmm. is like 1998. They were so ready to laugh and they just couldn't. 
and they were trying, and it yeah. was sad. Like it turns when oh, that happens. That's rough. Yeah, and then he made Center Stage, which his, which was the first thing he did that I don't think was based on anything, except mm. of course the that tradition way. of these films. Well, he also, I guess, he's a big being a theater person, um, a patron as well as a creative. There are so many beautiful scenes of ballet in this movie. Yeah, it the is. ballet scenes are. St- Stunning in this. And they're beautifully shot. And he shoots them. Basically, those scenes are just a shot of the proscenium. He does these big, wide shots. It's not like Moulin Rouge where Baz Luhrmann cut a million, you know, a million times to show you yeah. uh, dancing. This guy, it's one big, wide shot of the stage. Uh, and it's it's pretty to look at. And you know he has, like, an affinity for the stage because there's another one of the great shots in the movie not unironically, yes. uh, an unironic favorite shot in the movie is when all the uh, all the students sneak away from the party at the theater just to go stand on the stage and see what it look what the house looks like from yeah. the stage, which is another thing that I uh, love doing. I Anytime assume everybody I've, does that. Right? Oh yeah. Anytime I've gotten to go to uh, a, see a Broadway show that I have a friend in and go backstage afterwards or on stage, I will always. Yeah make my way to down center and look out at the house and just, it's something really cool. How do people, it's, I just, I was just on, I was just telling you, I was just on a stage with Dan Harmon um, a couple of weeks ago and mm-hmm. I don't know how anyone does it. You can't see yeah. a goddamn thing. That's <laughs> how they do it. Yeah. That's what helps. Total isolation. That, force, that fourth wall. As soon as the lights come on and mm-hmm. I can't see a thousand people looking at me, um, it's a lot easier to do the job. I just, I mean... I get it, but my thing is interaction. So right. like, I'm introducing movies, I'm talking to people, and mm-hmm. I, I'm kind of bouncing off the energy, and, and you can feel it. But yeah, stage play and performance, I assume, requires so much concentration that if mm-hmm. you start to incorporate the room, you're going to lose it. You're yeah. Just And you also, if, well, it plays different. Like if I'm playing myself in a thing, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's an interview or a show or a uh, podcast recording, podcast recording. Yeah. it's something that's, yeah, which we're doing tomorrow, we're doing it live podcast recording, that's different. I actually like to see the audience uh, because in comedy, you really feed off of that. Yeah. Um, but that's more an auditory thing than a visual thing. Um, but with a play, it's, I've got to, I'll still hear and know to hold for laughs and try to ride those waves. Right. But it really is, put the blinders on, let those lights block out the audience. I know what's on that fourth wall in the imagined world. So mm-hmm. I just did a play in Arizona it was 90 minutes, three actors, and um, it was a great show. It's called uh, Discord, the Gospel According to Thomas Jefferson, Charles Dickens, and Count Leo Tolstoy. All right. I uh, it's know the, the show, but I'm in. The three of them wrote, they three, the three of them each wrote their own version of the gospel from mm-hmm. three, very, three very different points of view. So it's the three of them reconciling that in purgatory. So it was me, Larry Cedar from Deadwood, and mm-hmm. Armin Shimmerman, uh, Quark from Deep Space Nine. That could be really. It was uh, who was a who are both brilliant stage actors. Like yeah. Larry is the king of the uh, of the working character actor, and Armin's a Shakespeare master. So it was like it was fun, but with that play because it's only three of us, it was just you walk out on stage, and we don't leave the stage the whole time. Right. It's just pages and pages and pages and pages of dialogue. Cause it's really really wordy. Scott written by Scott Carter, brilliant. Uh, Bill Maher's right hand, okay. his longtime showrunner, producer. Hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was one of those like, all right, we'd say beforehand, we'd be like, all right, fellas, see you on the other side, because, <laughs> whew, here we go. I can't even imagine that. It's ah, it's such a rush, though. Yeah. Yeah. I just, the, the um, Becky Johnson uh, from the Second City in Toronto, mm-hmm. she was telling me that one of the things, they're, they're doing a really aggressively political sketch right now, mm-hmm. uh, sketch show right now, because... You have to. <laughs> yeah, the world needs it right now. Yeah, the, you can't ignore it. And she was saying that the worst thing about it is that she and one of her co-writers have to redo the Trump stuff every day. To, oh, yeah. To accommodate whatever else he's done or said. Oh, you know, man, he, she's got a busy day today. Yeah. I don't know when this is going to come out, but, oh, oh man, he uh, she, they're going to have fun today. Yeah, for those of you uh, following randomly through time, which this is going to inevitably do, this is Saturday... October the 8th Mm -hmm. and 15 hours ago the grab them by the pussy comment happened unbelievable and yeah and right now those tiny hands too yeah well oh god no I hope (laughs) 
I was just gonna make like maybe that's why they didn't report it. It is horrible, Whoa. and I don't. I've been I've been actively fighting the urge to make jokes at this because it's no longer funny. Yeah, it's just like you just acknowledge publicly that you're a serial sexual assaulter, mm-hmm. and you're proud of it. Yeah, and not just this was in 2005. And the only reason that audio surfaced now is because somebody clearly held on to it. Mm-hmm. Because that's like, oh shit, this can't stay unknown. This like it had to come out. Yeah. But uh like it's just it's so sad. And as October surprises go, that is the most surprising. Yeah. And WikiLeaks just dumped some stuff about Hillary. It's, no, Nobody cares. No one cares. It's gone. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Do you think? I, I bet WikiLeaks is so mad right now <laughs> because they're so used to being the top story when they get a yeah. big break. Yeah, I picture Julian Assange somewhere angrily bleaching his hair. <laughs> Stole my thunder. I talked to that guy once. Did you meet At him? the Bell House in Brooklyn. Okay. He did a, because uh, I guess... Things are pretty boring when you're living in an embassy. <laughs> he did a Skype interview with the Bell House. Like, I guess they just had a night. Oh, he was promoting the WikiLeaks book. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And so I was like, they're like, who wants to ask a question to Julian Assange? I was like, I want to ask Julian Assange a question. So what did you ask him? Uh, I asked him which of the embassies had the best accommodations nice. and which were your friends. I would nothing, nothing important. Right. I could not think of anything important to ask him. But that's um, almost better. I yeah. want to see People were asking him important things, and I was like, so who are your embassy buddies? Mm-hmm. He said he really liked Ecuador. Ecuador has a great embassy. Very nice. I assume the, the cafeteria is good. Ecuadorian <laughs> food is delicious. <laughs> um, it's funny you mention the, 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 this comes up with the Donald Trump stuff, because one thing that is jarring about this movie, being a period piece, yeah. I mean, there are certain things that are universal and forever about it. As cliche as they are, yeah, yeah. a limousine full of college students sticking out the top, driving through Times Square, while a song whose lyrics are literally, yeah. we'll be friends forever, plays. Yeah, I kind of expected a crash at that point. I know, you right? You have to have a reversal. <laughs> Something terrible. Yeah. Yeah, just that moment in the movie that you're like, oh, well, this movie took a turn. Yeah. They go out on the circle line to the Statue of Liberty. They're all wearing the little oh, foam and things. Oh, right. Um, some things are sort of permanently New York about that and mm-hmm. permanently, you know, permanent fixtures. And then you see, uh, them right. She's riding at one point. She's riding across, uh, Cooper Nielsen, the primo ballerino. Is that what they call him? Is that the male version? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Um, of the, the ballet company driving across the, uh, Williamsburg bridge and there's the twin towers in the background. Yeah. And it's really jarring. It was the last year of movies, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Had them, but. It still comes up every now and then and it is yeah. always surprising. Um, I saw something. Well, now you're seeing, now that we're seeing movies made in like set in period that are mm-hmm. sort of trying to deal with it. Like, do you show it right away? Do you show it towards the end? Do you hide it? Uh, do you play that? weird loathsome game that that Robert Pattinson movie played what uh, oh, what did they do remember me you didn't see nobody no. saw remember me no it is it spoiler he dies in 9-11 oh, like the geez. whole point of this film is uh, that they they don't tell you exactly when it's taking place mm-hmm. and it's a little bit vague and it intru- it's from Emily DeRaven's perspective she played Claire on Lost mm-hmm. and she's uh, she is a student uh NYU I guess and she meets this troubled man who's in her class a young man and he's a young man of privilege and his father is disowning him because he wants to follow his dreams and his father is Pierce Brosnan and it's all really stiff and it's pretty lame And I mean if you're going to have a white privileged dad Pierce Brosnan's the guy to have he wears it well he does he wears it very, very well. And he's the only one in the movie who seems to know what kind of movie it is. But mm-hmm. because he's in a supporting role, he can't really telegraph it. Mm-hmm. And so this whole movie is building towards this huge twist ending, which is that he goes to visit his father's office in the World Trade Center oh. on 9-11. Okay. And they hold it back. Like It's almost as though like, they never acknowledge what year it is. They never tell you what's happening. It opens with a speech about terrorism, which is clever because it makes you think it's post-9-11 New York, mm-hmm. but it's not. And that's the big twist. And the huge... Oh, I, you're making this incredibly cringing faces. Yeah. I was in the theater. I was in a screening room watching this movie. And after about an hour, I think I started to figure it out. It, or something, something rang wrong. And it's just like, oh, are they trying to do something here? What are they doing? Because it's not a good movie. Yeah. And then... 
towards the end, he's in an uh, you don't again, you don't see it. You just see him get out of a cab and go into a building, and it's nondescript. It's all ground level. You can't see what mm-hmm. the building is. And then <laughs> Pattinson's in an elevator, and the numbers are ticking up, and it starts to hit 70, 71, 72. And I said out loud, oh, fuck you. I, <laughs> And, the, and like the seven other people uh. in the screening room were just like, no! Like you could feel this wave of shock roll through the audience. Uh. And it's clearly how it's supposed to play. Yeah. But I just, it's like a, there's a 14 year old girl out there who thinks this is the best movie ever made. And when she turns 15, she's going to hate herself for that. Yeah. It's so terrible. And it's one of those films like, I didn't even get to talk to Pattinson about it when I met him. I really wanted to. Mm-hmm. He's not. Like he's not doing a bad job. Everybody in it thinks it's all like nobody knows when they're making the movie how it's going to be presented. You don't, you right. can't see the format of it, and it's just the most awful, hand wringing, um, died too young, live too good for this world bullshit movie, mm. and it's just horrible. It's funny you mention that about um, about nobody in the none of the actors knowing. Yeah, you know, uh, because that's one thing. I guess the more films you do the more you can start to sense it. But that's one of my reasons for loving theater is the actors are in control of the tone. Right, yeah. We get to we get to control the pace. I mean, aside from a director crafting it, but in the moment yeah, on once the you, stage. Once you're out there, yeah, it's yours. It's sure. That timing is not left to an editor. I love editors. Uh, editors have done amazing <laughs> things. Specifically, the drunk history editors—they have done amazing work. That is incredible. Uh, work. Yeah, and um, and thank them for—I thank them for not showing me puking. Um, but <laughs> sometimes not to disparage editors. Yeah, sometimes it is funnier to leave it out. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's just. Um, but yeah, there's something about that—the um, the energy that when an actor can do it. Um, but I wanted to get back to um, about the uh, the datedness mm-hmm. of it. I feel like one thing that this movie suffers from is we are now 16 years later than when this movie came out. Yep. And um, in that 16 years, women across the country and globally, but women across the United States, and I don't want to sound like a mansplainer, (laughs) uh, but have really um, have definitely put their foot down on the way that uh, women have been perceived sure. in entertainment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Popular culture has... And beautifully so, and rightfully so. Yeah. It's been like a spontaneous evolution, except it's not spontaneous because it's been coming all along. Right. But now it's happening. We're and in it. watching the movie Center Stage, it is pre-that. <laughs> uh, it is very... I mean, there's a lot of... There's a lot of body issue stuff in this movie. Some of it is well handled, and some of it is a little old timey. Yeah. But there's one great scene that sort of redeems, uh, that sort of redeems this. Uh, one girl is kicked out of the school because she's gaining weight, mm-hmm. and her mom tells the other students, uh, the the her three best friends who are the main characters, you know, don't ever let anybody tell, don't ever let anybody make you feel bad about yourself. You're beautiful. You're strong. Um, and then much of the movie undermines that message, but at say, least yeah. there is that moment of that message in the movie. Yeah, you're beautiful, you're strong, you're also currently really thin. Yeah. You're going to be fine. Yeah, exactly. But it is it is weird to watch that from a, a contemporary perspective. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have four nieces, none of them was born yet at the time. And they're growing up in a world where if someone tells them that, they're just going to flip them off. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fantastic. Absolutely. But to watch the attitudes, I mean, pretty much everything Peter Gallagher says in his... Horrifying. Is it Balanchine or Balanchine? Uh, Balanchine-esque? Balanchine. Balanchine Balanchine-esque, in his Balanchine-esque way, is supposed to be confronting people with this gritty reality. But it just sounds like a cliche from a 1930s movie. Mm -hmm. And I think it's supposed to. Um, certainly the, the screenwriter, whose name I'm always going to get wrong if I don't check it, Carol Heikinen, who also wrote Empire Records and The Thing Called Love. So she's, I loved Empire Records. Yeah, and she's all about groups of young people. She's mm-hmm. like young dynamic people being young and dynamic at each other. Right. I think she knows, and I'm pretty sure Heitner knows, that this guy is already a dinosaur. Mm-hmm. But he's still in charge. Right. So his attitudes have to be taken seriously within the world of the film, even though we're allowed to sort of step outside. I think that's why Zoltana is such an interesting presence, because even then, like, she's just, she's got this permascowl, this no bullshit thing going Mm -hmm. on where you can feel her character rejecting it. And so what happens there is, especially retroactively now that she's 
probably, I mean, easily the most famous person in the yeah, movie. Yeah, there's not, yeah, it's right. not a coincidence that she became the biggest star out of that movie. Yeah, a lot of the other people, like one of the male dancers turned up again this year in Flesh and Bone, but he hadn't worked on, on screen in like mm-hmm. nine or ten years. Yeah. And she's so good at immediately resisting what she's being given yeah. by, by the film itself. Like her character becomes even more interesting now because not only is she the one you recognize, but you're on side with her instantly because she's already living in the present, if that makes any mm-hmm. sense. Um, and I kind of weirdly hope that someday someone asks her where that character would be now because like, <laughs> I bet she has it figured out. Like, I just I yeah. have a feeling she knows who she's playing so well that the movie itself cannot contain her. Yeah. It's a really neat performance. It's a really interesting thing to do. It's fun to watch. She's... And and then on the flip side, there's Jodie Sawyer, the character. I don't remember the actor's name. Oh. She's great in it. They're all, they're all you know, to find ballet dancers who can act. Was that Amanda Schull? Amanda Schull, yeah. yes. Uh, Amanda Schull, she's uh, still acting. In, yeah, in she's things. around. She's in, um, uh, she's on 12 Monkeys right now, shooting in Toronto, in fact. Oh, hey, there you go. Yeah, so, Amanda, Say hello when you there, get back. Yeah. Um, People still love you and what you do. Yeah. And that well, and then you know she's the total flip side to Zoe Saldana's character because everything she does is even if the movie passes the Bechdel test, she does not. Right. Yeah. Everything it, that she does in that movie is to please the men around her until the very final moment when it's I'm taking a stand and I'm here to please me. But the movie is an hour or is uh, an hour and fifty minutes, yeah. and she does that in minute or you know an yeah, hour forty nine. Yeah. It's it's a weird... I mean, again, it's the kind of thing that would probably seem like a really good idea structurally mm-hmm. to an older male director. Right. It doesn't really reflect people, mm-hmm. but it's what melodrama demands. Right. And, and this really is. It's an archetype-driven melodrama. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with embracing that. I mean, there are yeah. films that still do it, and they're kind of interesting now because we're seeing fewer and fewer of them. I think mm-hmm. that's really just the province of Lifetime TV movies now. And I say that disparagingly, even though Lifetime is doing some good stuff. But yeah. we're in this wave of evolution narratively where it's not all happening at once. And so the really retrograde stuff stands out more. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's this collision of old-fashionedness and just hokey. And in center stage, we have the distance of time, and it kind of feels like this world is always going to be like this. Mm-hmm. The, the only thing you can do is rebel in your own artistic terms and learn to be yourself, but that's the message of every one of these things. Yeah. It's tough, though, that that is, that that is the still the reality of it, that it mm-hmm. feels like, oh, yeah, this... Peter Gallagher's dinosaur, as you put it, yeah. is still running a lot of these yeah. things. Like, they're still the people in charge. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I, you know. Yeah, I think the culture is moving fast enough now that we're more easily able to detect that, mm-hmm. to see a sensibility that it just feels a little hokey or a little stiff. Or the idea that, you know, uh, when, it, when the president, when the candidate for president of the United States talks about the cyber. You just suddenly go, you'd have no fucking... Like, you don't know what you're talking yeah. about, and you think you do. Like, yeah. It's not that he's bluffing. He thinks he knows what he's talking about. I think he may think that people can't see his 3 a.m. tweets. <laughs> that he's just like... He may think he's ranting into a void. It's possible. I mean, it's better that way. He gets right? to be more honest about himself. It's It all comes back... Maybe it's just because I'm in New York right now, but mm-hmm. it all comes back to Trump. Everything is coming back yeah, to Trump. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Gene Gray and I talked about Fight Club, and that episode will definitely already have dropped. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, that's a pre, that's a Trump movie. Like, that's a pre-9-11 movie that doesn't yeah. feel like one, but it also feels like an absolute expression of... Like, the people who don't get Fight Club but love it mm-hmm. and don't know that it's about them, Yeah, those are the Trump supporters. Those are the ones who just see a charismatic leader and want to follow him and do whatever he says. And just the idea that Donald Trump is perceived as charismatic by 30% of America. I don't know. It's just... (sighs) He's on television. That's how that works. I hope that by the time this drops... He something will have happened. I mean, as we are as we are recording this, there are giant Republican donors who are meeting to figure out how to kick him off the ballot. Right. After this whole comment. I mean, it's but who knows? The guy is if if John Gotti was the Teflon Don, yeah. because nothing stuck to him, then Donald Trump 
is a Teflon pan with an extra layer of orange oil yeah. sprayed into it. Yeah. And then just filled with garbage. It is just the most... I mean, we had Rob Ford in Toronto. Mm-hmm. We've been through this. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to a journalist friend of mine just like an hour ago, and we were both, we were both there. We both watched it. She's younger than I am, but she was still present for all of it. And it's one of those things where it's like, we're like... We are like abuse survivors who are watching it happen to somebody else. And it's... <laughs> That's not like it's not funny. It is yeah. funny because it's it's, funny. it's terrible. But the only thing you can do at this point is is try to make as much noise as you can because mm-hmm. if, you know, like who doesn't already know? Like yeah. who who needs to be dissuaded? These guys are supporting him because he's who he is because they think they have a shot at power. And that's why I don't think it's going to matter. He's yeah. not going to. There's not enough of those people. Yeah. This comment today destroyed him. I hope so. With the with the. L- l- well, he lost the few he, remaining rational people who were planning on voting for him. Yeah, and hopefully most of the women. I mean that that oh, would also yeah. that would also help if he was alienated his his own female support base. Yeah, but I just the the success of Trump, and I promise, listeners, I promise we're going to get back to center stage. Uh, <laughs> but the success of Trump proves, like it it proves that conspiracy theories aren't bullshit at this point. Like the Illuminati don't exist. There is no secret cabal. He'd have been taken out years ago. Yeah. Months ago, at, le- at the very <laughs> least. Like, he'd never have gotten the nomination. And I want to know if people are more terrified by the idea that nothing is controlled and this can happen because chaos wins. Well, I wasn't until you mentioned it. Yeah. Or, like, is it is it more reassuring to people who believe in conspiracy theories that you know what's going on, but you can't do anything about it? Or that no one knows what's going on and no one can do anything about it. Mm-hmm. I'm really fascinated by this and it's just on my mind a lot right now. Well, you're in New York City. Yeah. And, it's, um, and there are big buildings here that say Trump on them. Does Toronto have a Trump building? We have a Trump building. I was explaining this to somebody, too. They don't believe me, but it's true. When the Trump Hotel opened three, four years ago now, um, they had there's a there's a hotel in, in Toronto called the Shangri-La where they mm-hmm. sort of they, they sent the whole place with jasmine. It's supposed to be an, an Asian-themed refuge, an Asian-flavored world. Mm-hmm. And you go in and you smell like jasmine and it's nice. And then Great. you stop noticing it. In the Trump Hotel, they tried it, but it was too strong. It wasn't jasmine. <laughs> Whatever it was, it smelled like what you would do to cover up having murdered a hooker. <laughs> What's laying around yeah. in this hotel bathroom? Yeah, it's like bleach and Febreze and Ugh. mint. And it just, oh, it's, it's awful. And it's only in the lobby. In the Shangri-La, it's pumped mm. through the air vents. It's all over the place. So you walk through the lobby and you're walking through it like future CSI location and you get in the elevator and the world is normal again. But in that, mo- and then you go into the rooms and there are all these chocolates with Trump written on them. Of course there are. Uh, and it's just like everything he does is this weird attempt to be classy, but he doesn't know what classy is. It's the same way Rob Ford was. He just, yeah. you know, he was a man of the people because he ate terrible food in front of them and then he would go off and insult them and do coke and ra- yeah. throw racial insults around and people still loved him because he was a real person. It's like, he's not a real person. He's the person you want to be the farthest from in the room. Yeah. There's that's ugh, that's the thing. I like I like that he's uh, that he's against the establishment, and I like that Donald Trump is you know he's he's a different kind of politician. He's an outsider, and you're like, no, there are there's a reason that some people have done this professionally yeah. for a long time, yeah, and gotten good at it. He is yes, he stands against all of that, yes, but what he stands for is. Pretty horrifying. Yeah, it just gets uglier and uglier yeah. every time it goes on. I just, I, I picture Mitt Romney somewhere in his room thinking just like, what did I do wrong? Yeah. And at this point, I was pretty sure he had a murder basement, and I still think he does. Yeah, Mitt Romney? Like, yeah, he's like one of those guys. He's too squeaky clean. Yeah, he's just yeah. got a secret, he's got a secret pleasure that you don't ever want to find yeah. out about. And, and yet, somehow, with Trump, we're at a position where it is entirely possible that all of this... I've been trying to figure out how to tweet this, and it just doesn't fit into 140 characters. But <laughs> like everything he does seems to be trying to normalize the fact that whatever other thing is coming out, whatever the really, truly horrible thing is, will just be one more. I, whatever I, it is. I hope this was the horrible thing. Nah. You think there's more? There's got to be. There, there, this, this is... Like, he brags about grabbing women. That's yeah. not enough for him. The fact that Howard Dean lost... Uh, lost when he did just for going yeah, yeah. in a rally just a, and awkward. Donald Trump is the nominee still going to be in the debate on Sunday <sighs> and he just said 
the most horrific things yeah. about and, women. And tomorrow he'll deny it. I, can, yeah. I never said it. I didn't say it. You uh, apologize for it. No, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, somebody, oh, there's a great tweet out there somewhere. A journalist someday said that someday, a year from now, Donald Trump will look someone in the eye uh, on television and say, I never ran for president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he'll mean it. And this is where we are now. And so... At the same time, I can see the appeal of melodrama. Ah, mm-hmm. I found a way to bring it back. Yeah, uh, well done. <laughs> but the, the, a movie like Center Stage is in a, inherently reassuring because it tells you you know what's happening. You know where this is going to go. Mm-hmm. Everything's going to be fine. Even the people who suffer are suffering for their art. Mm-hmm. And if they can't, I mean, again, if they can't win, they're losers. It's their fault. They're, 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 yeah. they're, they're failures. I don't have respect for failure people. But... <laughs> It is a weirdly, like, that's the world Trump belongs in. He's the cartoon villain in that movie. He's yeah. the guy who won't let someone be late with the rent. Um, he's, he's, he belongs in there. He doesn't belong in the real world. And out here, no one knows what to do with him because he is some kind of outsized ego monster that will not abide by the rules of life as opposed to the rules of drama. But, of course, in the rules of drama, by now, he would have had his comeuppance. Right. So, Center Stage oh, yeah. is more reassuring that way. Well, I don't know. I don't know if he would have had his comeuppance by now. He would have had his, he'll have his comeuppance in November, right? <laughs> oh, I want it sooner. I know. It needs to be sooner. But back to center stage, yes. Yeah, but it but well those, that kind of movie does comfort people. Mm-hmm. I mean that it's why it's comfort food. You can just keep going back to it. It really is. That <laughs> movie is just candy. And it's the world that you're comfortable in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's even little things. Ah, there's so many great moments of indulgence in that movie. Uh, I'll give you two. One is a, another montage kind of scene, because I love my montages. Sure. It's just a, It's not even a montage. It's just a scene that really does cut around to a lot of angles. It's the kids go out, yeah. and they uh, come back home hungover, or they go back to class the next day hungover. They get in trouble for it, and they're forced to clean all the mirrors in the school. Oh, that's right. Cut to... Sudsy mirror cleaning fight. Right, because they're going to make it fun. Yeah. It's a punishment. Yeah, it's a punishment, but they're all laughing. and ha- The whole movie looks like the cut, like a board game box. <laughs> like the entire movie is just the box of yeah. the board game, center stage, the game. Yeah, this happy, charming, multi-ethnic cast posted yeah. in interesting ways. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's right. And there, and then my favorite, uh, my favorite other moment, I have so many favorite moments from this movie. <laughs> uh, Runner up moment is uh, is Donna Murphy's speech. Donna Murphy, brilliant yeah, actor, we have not Broadway given actor. Credit to Bro- Donna Murphy. Not enough credit to Donna Murphy. She is a, she's an amazing actor. She absolutely is. Um, and she's she she can radiate concern and sternness at the same time, mm-hmm. which makes her so great. Like she even does it in her without voice. moving. Yeah, she yeah. does it with Entangled. She does it in a voice role. Oh, um, she's so good in Tangled. Yeah, too. but it's just yeah. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting your. Yeah. Mind. Oh no, no no. But at, at this moment in particular, it's a pretty silly monologue. Uh, it's like you know when the when the world is getting to. She's standing next to the bar in the in the um, oh, ballet studio. Right. She says, uh, "So when things are getting you down, the world isn't out there." And I'm I'm butchering this quote. <laughs> the world isn't out there. It's right here. And she pats the bar in yeah. the. Oh man, <laughs> that moment and the other moment. That's like is, the closest the movie comes to being an actual musical. Yeah. Oh, if I there know. Had been a song, you'd be fine with it. Yeah, I would have loved it if a song just came <laughs> in right there. There, uh, that and um, okay, one more scene that I These? totally love. No, this is in weird. the Broadway dance studio, which still exists, a real place, uh, which is just off of Broadway. And there is a strip club next door, but that's beside the point. That's New York, baby. Right? Yeah. Look. It's the old New York. You may not make it that one block all the way to Broadway, <laughs> but you're going to make it that half block to <laughs> the... Uh, sorry, that's terrible. Up the stairs to the glitter house. Yes. Yeah. They're, uh, they're in the, um, the, the... It's a whole musical number of this dance class. It's, it's showing how much different this dance class is than her regular ballet classes. Right. Uh, when they dance to the Red Hot Chili Peppers and they do the entire song Higher Ground. That's right. Uh, reminded that we're not so far from the 90s in yeah, this movie. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, this was a hit. What would it be now? Now? Uh, that would be like a... Gaga, Rihanna, something, like Girl Powery. Yeah, but if they were going to go with it's a rock even... band version. Oh, that's true. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's not even... I don't... I, I was going to say, I don't even know what Rihanna and... This movie is are. not girl power. They're not girl powery. That's not it either. I, it's funny, like, I, when you were talking about the scene where, where Saldana stubs the cigarette out, it's mm-hmm. like, that is pretty much what Rihanna is doing now, only just on a huge scale. And Beyonce. Like, that's... Yeah. They took that and ran with it, and I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if it's the kind of thing that 
just incorporated itself into their their tour bus viewing or something. Like it's a thing that you pull out to watch. I don't know who, and, and I don't know if they watched the sequels because we haven't mentioned that there are That's two right. sequels to this movie. Yes, which are. I started watching one, and it's they're pretty unwatchable. Yeah, I, I never got around to either one. Yeah. I don't think they ever made it to... No, they, they weren't released theatrically. They no. were straight to DVD. They were straight, yeah, they were straight yeah. to Netflix or DVD or whatever. <laughs> uh, but my favorite, absolute favorite line, uh, in the end of the movie, again, for those who haven't seen it, I'm sorry for spoiling things, um, and uh, at the end of the movie, Maureen decides she doesn't want to be a dancer anymore. That's right. And she goes to her mother, who is the perfect stage mom. This this actor, I, I, I should be looking these up and giving shout-outs, but the stage mom in that is great. Uh, perfectly over the top. Yeah. And she, uh, her mom, furious with her, is, is trying to find out why she is, is leaving this life that she's been doing since she was nine. She's been at the school since she was nine years old. And she, uh, she looks at her mom with tears in her eyes and she says, you didn't have the feet. I don't have the heart. Oh. I mean, oh, when I saw that movie the first time, I may have thrown popcorn in the air <laughs> in joy at that beautiful, beautiful, insanely, wonderfully cheesy line. I wonder if that was the starting point for the script, too. Because you can sort of feel how much energy has been invested in it. Oh, yeah. This is the line. This is the line that we remember. They gave her a lot of good lines. When she shows up at her boyfriend, her, her, she and her boyfriend break up, and then she shows back up at his apartment... And she's standing in the doorway, crying, and asks him, "How much of uh, how much of what you liked about me was my bat was me being a dancer, and how much of it was just me?" And then falls into his arms. I mean, it's yeah. such a cheesy script, but it's. Um, and then the very final moment is the girl who has struggled the whole time. It is a long crane shot that pulls away from the lobby of the American Ballet Theater as. Spontaneously, the entire crowd in the lobby just applauds her. Because that happens. Yeah, everybody just started applauding her. Yeah. This is is the world we live in. Um, I want to live in that world. I would much rather live in their version. I love New York City. This also, I'm a huge fan of New York City, and this movie is a love letter to New York. Not like a Woody Allen love letter to New York, but like a. Like an AT&T commercial. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yes. Love letter to New York. Um, but that's the version of the city that I grew up wanting to live in, yeah. like taking a motorcycle across the Williamsburg Bridge and going to your loft that overlooks the city and climbing into this limo and riding through Times Square. Like, it's just the yeah. whole thing is. Yeah. I yeah. wonder if their limo crashed with Josh Baskin's limo oh, when he was what? poking out the top of his limo. In, Some kind of, were they in Times Square? Uh, I, I want to say maybe. Going. Could have been. I don't know. Might have been Lincoln Center. No, I think it was Square. It's yeah, it, it it is the kind of movie that is it's like an aspirational melodrama because it shows mm-hmm. you the world as it should as the movie insists it should be. Mm-hmm. And like when Natalie Merchant as, as sexist as sexist as it is. Yeah. And as when Natalie Merchant did the show, she picked all about Eve and it was exactly oh, the yeah? same thing. It's the movie that she's always had with her and always watches on the bus and mm-hmm. it's her it's the thing she retreats into and she wanted to exist in that level, not of of New York necessarily but the society thing like mm-hmm. be among the swells yeah that's how she put it and it's um, it's so odd to see the things that we connect to on that level mm-hmm. I don't know that I have a New York movie like that or an LA movie or anything at all but it's um, I wish I did because then I'd mm-hmm. have I'd have a vision and instead it's just like well every time I'm here now it's just like well I should live here it's basically what it is yeah uh, and I don't and I'm mad at in myself. New York yeah yeah it's like it's a great town. Yeah, Toronto's a great town Toronto's too. Though. Fine, but I've I've lived my whole life there, and there was a yeah. there was a moment in two thousand seven when my wife got a job here, and we almost moved, and we should have. And every time I come in, I end up in near the old apartment, and it's just like, uh, God damn it, why aren't we? I yeah. mean, we and we wouldn't be there now. Like this is the other thing that's idealized in its own way because mm-hmm. we'd be somewhere else. We would you don't stay in an apartment for on the Upper West Side for. 11 years that's just not how that works right. and or whatever and we would have moved to somewhere else we I don't know where we'd be but we'd be somewhere else and I just want to get back to that moment where we should have we should have stayed and didn't that's what that's about and center stage is about the moment where you know who you are mm-hmm. and it's the same thing and I think that's why melodrama is so seductive yeah you want it to you want your life to be a movie and if this is the movie you want it to be and you can go retreat into that anytime yeah. you want. You'll it's, still be there for I've it. been to auditions. I've struggled, too. At the end of my movie, is the whole crowd going to stand around and applaud 
as I've just been given the job of a lifetime. <laughs> yes, they like, will. Mark. Yeah, <laughs> they will because they'll see it. Oh, crane shot. Yeah, exactly. We should all be so lucky. <laughs> Uh, so then the final question of the podcast is always the same, uh, mm-hmm. which is what of this movie is in you in, in your creative DNA? Do you ever find yourself pulling on it or using it for anything? Oh yeah. 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 Well, it's like the Rocky montage kind of thing about it mm-hmm. that, that, uh, I've watched that dance class, uh, <laughs> the, no kidding. The, uh, the red hot chili peppers dance class number, yeah. um, to get like amped up, really? Yeah, I've watched that, and I'll use that, and I'll use the ballet that they do at the very end. The uh, the they do a ballet. The big finale ballet uh, is uh, to Michael Jackson and Jamiroquai. That's right. And it is great. Like I don't know. I just that. Like I said at the beginning, the, the I love the idea of ensemble and we're all in this together to create a thing, but we're going to focus on a few choice people, each of whom I can find elements of myself in. Right. Um, Jody Sawyer dealing with the, Jesus, this life is really fucking hard. Yeah. Um, that's the, I mean, like that's the thing that's missing from the X-Men movies. So mm-hmm. To get back to that comparison for a second, they have powers. They are innate. Now, when it's like a piano player, you had to practice for years. Mm-hmm. Ballerinas, dancers, any form of physical activity, like there's talent and then there's skill mm-hmm. and by the time we meet these characters they've been doing this forever and so the actors playing them presumably because there's a really natural feel there I don't think anybody's really faking it right and you don't get the sense that the movie is sophisticated enough to be protecting an actor that can't do it they're not cutting around behavior. right so you get to every every one of these movies introduces you to these characters when they're pretty much at their physical peak mm-hmm. but they haven't figured out how to use it yet yeah. And that's where the X-Men comparison comes back because that's, you know, like, you're here to learn and all that. But it's, uh, they're like little gods and th- it's so alien to me to, to watch people do this stuff that I can't, for a minute every time I can't relate to them. It's just like, oh my God. Like, yeah. But of course they're fictional, so it's okay. Yeah, and, exactly. And you have the out. But yeah, if, and if you see, if you feel that pull towards that world and you see pieces of yourself in them, then mm-hmm. of course it's going to be reassuring to you rather than terrifying to me right. and Cronenbergian. <laughs> Did you refer to center stage as Cronenbergian? I, my response is Cronenbergian. Ah, there you but go. I'm from Toronto so I can pull it off. Ah, there you go. I'm allowed. But yeah, so how do you use it now? It's just like wh- it's, what are you amping yourself up for? What kind of roles are you chasing? This is the kind of movie that when because I only moved to New York uh, two and a half years ago, oh. I lived in Los Angeles for fourteen years. Loved it. It's a wonderful place. It is. I will go back there. There's work there. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but this this movie and movies like it, fame, um, you know, that sort of they they basically created the version of New York that I wanted to move to the, um, walking through, you know, the, the shot circling around you while you're looking at times square with yeah. a bag slung over your shoulder with dance shoes in it. Right. You know what I mean? Cause I grew up dancing as well as acting, okay. singing as well. Um, not like I'm not like a dancer by any means. I just like doing musicals. Right. Well, you're better at it by <laughs> definition than most people you meet. Yeah, that's fair. Cause guess. we don't like, that's the thing, right? It's a yeah. skill that, and again, this is the other thing that, that Center Stage really does do that I don't think a lot of these movies do. It acknowledges that there are people who are better at the thing mm-hmm. and know it. Yeah. But also it acknowledges that the people who aren't better at the thing know it. They're still good, but they're not good enough. And that's right. a really interesting thing that almost never gets explored because you get stuff like Whiplash where you know the lead is bullied and tortured into being the best, but mm-hmm. that's okay because he's a void. Yeah. Like he's, he, there's no self-doubt. And that's the most interesting thing about Center Stage is that it really picks that scab. And yeah. characters are ruined by self-doubt and nerves. Yeah. And, that's not and some that understand that yes. uh, are fine. There's one character, she's a minor character in it, but she's great. Um, and she calls her calls her mom to tell her what... Um, she's calling her mom to tell her what things she got in the... What casting she got right, in the show. Yeah. She's, and she's like, I'm going to be right. doing this thing in the show. Uh, well, Maureen's going to be doing the lead. But, you know, for where I'm at, uh, this is a great role for me. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that's... You know. Yeah. You don't see that very often. You yeah. don't see the secondary characters being given dignity, right? They're the ones mm-hmm. who run crying off when they don't get the part. Right. Yeah. And I just... I think about, you know, Jessica Chastain going to Juilliard and... 
just toiling in a relative obscurity mm-hmm. and now emerging as not only like the probably the best actors of her generation but also being okay with it because she it happened when she was old enough to handle it yeah so you evolve into the person like your best self and all that at these schools and if it happens too early you can be a monster and if it happens way too early you can be peter gallagher yeah he's in, no, i've met him he's very nice but the, the right. peter gallagher in the movie who has just never been challenged and is absolutely convinced that his way is the right and only way yeah and i love movies that let you fill in those blanks that say that you know this one's going to be all right you won't see her again but she's going to be fine Mm -hmm. and that's like that's rare in these films especially now where it's just more and more about casting an a-lister and letting everything else just fall into place around them Mm -hmm. um you know, Anna Kendrick is not not going to succeed in Pitch Perfect. Right. That's, like, she's going to overcome her challenges. Yeah. And then the sequel, just as a result, has nowhere to go but introduce another character who has to overcome her challenges. Yeah. So they're still pleasurable. Those are fun. But yeah, there's something about Center Stage when you picked it. It's just like, oh, there's more. To, we can talk about this. There's more yeah. in there than I remembered. And it was great. So thank you for bringing it. And if My you have pleasure. any advice to future theater kids... This is the moment where you can give it to Oh, advice to future theater kids. Or current theater kids, I suppose. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, future theater kids would be babies now. They probably don't know English yet. No. Um, but this could, you know, in the future, be downloaded into their brains. Uh, that's true. Mm-hmm. I was, oh, yeah, it goes on the internet. It stays forever. <laughs> um, I would just say... I, I will just pass along... I, won't, I don't have any advice to give. I have advice to, that I've received that I will pass along. Sure. Uh, which is keep doing it. The one who does it the longest wins. And, yeah. And I have found it to be true. Yeah. I've dealt with a lot of... I've been in this business for a long time, uh, and I have seen ups and downs, and I have uh, seen a lot of actors who, like you said, you know, hit early, and then things stopped, and they just got out of the game. And I've seen dear friends of mine uh, who we all sort of came up together and are just now hitting their stride. Yeah, uh, and he's one of my closest friends. He, he he's just started really working a lot, and he's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I'm a character actor. I ain't that pretty, but my career didn't start till I was 40. Yeah, I was like, "Yeah, that's you know, stick around, stay in it. Yeah, and if you're comfortable with who you are and what you can do, that's mm-hmm. got to help. Absolutely. I mean, the just you can you can doubt everything about yourself, but as long as you're still doing it, I yeah. think you know what you're doing. Even if you like, I've, I've, this is episode. I don't even know what number this is, but I've done at this point. I've probably had a hundred of these recordings banked, mm-hmm. and I'm so I'm starting to figure out how to do it. <laughs> so thank you for coming along at this point. Oh, it's my <laughs> it's pleasure. Very encouraging. Thank you. I will learn from your example. We're only on I think eighty with our uh, podcast. You're really actually. We started around the same time. Did we? Yeah. My, this next week's episode is eighty four. Oh, right. So we're sort of lapping each other. Yeah. It's kind of good. I love it. Yeah. All right, we're podcast buddies. Yeah. Perfect. My thanks to Mark Gagliardi, who will be reunited with his Thrilling Adventure Hour castmates Paul F. Tompkins, Paget Brewster, and Mark Evan Jackson at the Bell House in Brooklyn on Saturday, November 12th for a special live show presented by the Work Juice Corporation. You can also hear Mark debate the great questions of our time, such as dogs or cats and shower or bath. Each week with fellow adventure coteer Hal Lublin on We Got This with Mark and Hal, available from the Maximum Fun Network wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks also to Aaron Abrams. He knows what he did. You can find Mark on Twitter at Mark Gags, M-A-R-K-G-A-G-S, and you can find Center Stage on DVD from Sony Pictures Home Entertainment and for sale and rental on iTunes and Google Play. If you haven't watched it in a while, well, Zoe Saldana still kills it. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. If you want to leave a review up on iTunes, that would be very kind of you. This week's call sign is, whatever you feel, just dance it. Thanks for listening. I'm afraid you're just too darn loud.